Okay, our next speaker is Kelly Nooner. Kelly is a transdisciplinary designer who's passionate about exploring the intersections of people, systems, and technology. Their background includes work with companies ranging from nonprofits and startups to Fortune 500 companies in healthcare, technology, education, fintech, and retail, both in consulting and in-house at Fast Company. They center their design and futures practice around responsible design and participatory practices. They have completed dedicated training in equity centered design and research in responsible tech development with organizations including Creative Reaction Lab, Humanity Centered, and Gray Area. Kelly is currently the global chapter and community lead for Design Futures Initiative and is a city lead for SHIFI. Kelly graduated from the New School and Parsons with a focus in design management, which combined design, business, marketing, and psychology. So with that, I will let you take it away, Kelly. Thanks so much, Casey. All right, so what I'm here to talk about today uh, is imagining AI futures, um, a design futures approach. Um, so thanks so much for the introduction. Um, so to start off with, um, I wanted to share a little bit about uh, my interest in AI and what kind of sparked me embarking on this project. So earlier last year, I was doing work for a client on natural language processing. And one of the big things that um, at my last company we tried to bring to our clients was thinking about some of the um, responsible tech implications and um, ethical risks. So a couple of things that came up in our research, um, you know, there's different things around inclusion in large language models, um, you know, what languages are represented, what cultures are represented. And there are two things that really um, stood out to me. Um, one was uh, the creation of a virtual rapper who got signed to Capitol Records and then got dropped for basically, um, you know, uh, kind of perpetuating stereotypes and like appropriating culture without actually paying the artist. Um, you know, for example, the artist who provided the voice for this rapper like wasn't actually compensated, um, I think beyond initially providing their voice. And another um, article I recently came across um, that I think kind of summarizes some of my interest in imagining different AI futures is um, AI and the American Smile, which represents how, um, you know, whose uh, who's cultural norms and things are included in the AI systems we're currently using today. So what this article goes around um, or goes over is um, how a lot of the popular image um, generation platforms um, kind of put Western culture on, um, you know, any sort of image of a group of people and assume that like, yeah, everybody smiles the same way or something like that. So this got, these are kind of a couple of things that got me starting to imagine or think about like what different types of AI futures we need to design for and what we need to have truly, um, you know, inclusive and responsible experiences. So looking at the AI present, um, you know, there's obviously been this big rush to um, adopt AI for different reasons, um, you know, kind of to have a competitive advantage, to reduce costs, to, um, you know, maybe re like reduce staffing, to relieve a burden that AI is supposed to be able to help us with, um, but maybe without exploring some of the consequences that we should be. So for example, um, the, I think it was the National Eating Disorders Association decided to um, replace their human workers with a chatbot and it got suspended after four days um, for giving folks harmful advice, um, you know, just based on the information all these language models have collected from the internet. Um, uh, also, um, open AI, um, you know, outsourced uh, kind of some of the um, basically a lot of like things around AI systems are still currently supported by humans, um, you know, to give the illusion that it's these technological systems working for you, but it's still um, some of the same way as like content moderation, and social media, there's outsourced workers who are kind of flagging and training different data for, um, you know, low amounts of money. And, you know, there are some kind of interesting signals around uh, workers currently unionizing to kind of protect their rights. So that's super cool. And then even the big tech companies that are rushing to develop this technology are warning their own staff about chatbots um, and maybe in different ways than the public might know about the accuracy of information, um, about what information is actually represented. Um, so these are just kind of some current things. And it's just interesting to, um, you know, look at, you know, with all, with billions of dollars invested in this, why aren't we kind of seeing these potential failures or consequences before they arrive. 
So that's where design features come in, is how can we anticipate and design for the unforeseen consequences of AI? Um, it seems like they'd be hard to predict, but fortunately, unforeseen consequences are just potential futures. So using design features approaches can help us explore relationships, power dynamic, and dependencies of systems that expand our understanding of what we could or even want to design. And you know, designing for an increasingly complex and fast-paced world requires methods that maybe break beyond our usual processes that are kind of linear and looking to kind of constrain scopes. So with foresight and futures, we can avoid harmful and costly consequences and imagine true transformation that kind of expands, you know, who technology can be for and also how our businesses um, or organizations can, um, you know, really serve a broader range of people. So what we'll cover today, I'm going to go over a brief introduction of design futures for folks who don't have a background in it. I'm going to go over a project in um, AI education futures that I've been working on and then go into a little bit of process of so how to incorporate futures thinking and AI into your work. And on this project that I'm sharing, I did use, um, you know, AI uh, to kind of support me in it. So I will show you how I've been using it and kind of like what informed those decisions that I made about how to use it and um, kind of how to work with it. So as a brief intro to design futures, um, I want you to take a moment and think about a memorable experience you've had with the future. Um, you know, maybe it was a book, movie, or exhibit. What did it make you think about and how did it make you feel? And you can put, um, put your answer in the chat um, if you want. We'll kind of see uh, what experiences people are already having with the future. So this could be a sci-fi movie or book. Um, maybe a recent, you know, like one of those recent, um, like Apple's recent release, something like that. <laughs> All right, so while people are kind of thinking about that, so defining futures, futures are stories about change. They help us develop narratives and visions, shape discussions, build consensus, and develop plans in an increasingly complex world. So futures are stories and not facts. They're stories about change. There's no right or wrong, and they they're subjective and reflect the opinions and the biases of folks who are creating them. Um, they're visions and not predictions. So we can apply our imagination to envision possible futures and then bring them back to how we, to think about how we make decisions today. They're curved and not linear. There's various curves of growth, decline, and they're influenced by different forces. So if you think about in January 2020, I'm sure most of us wouldn't have imagined that we could work remotely for most days of the week. But this big shift of the pandemic happened and that kind of changed the curve of some remote work, um, you know, futures that people have been imagining. And it's really accelerated a lot of development in that space. Uh, futures are multiversal and not singular. So each person can imagine many possible futures and what one person dreams, another person might find to be a nightmare. Futures are also inequitable and not evenly distributed. Change doesn't impact people evenly or fairly. So it's valuable to uh, visualize inequities in futures and think about how that shows up in present and future products and services. So what are we kind of um, codifying? What do we need to change for the future? Futures are also conflicting and challenging with positives and negatives. Um, so there's, we don't just want to explore extreme utopias and dystopias when we're imagining, you know, experienced futures. It's more like how we experience the world where there's a range of good and bad things that happen throughout a week or a day. Um, there's a great quote um, from a couple of academics that there's nothing to learn in heaven and no one wants to live in hell. So if there's no reason to go to that future, you can't get people to invest in it and um, in that scenario. You need something challenging and conflicting for folks to explore when you're designing futures. And, um, you know, you're already working in futures every day. Every time that you're creating a wireframe or, um, you know, designing a new app, it's like not, or service, it's not in the world yet. So you're already kind of doing that future work. And what I'm hoping with this session is like kind of maybe expanding the, like, you know, the aperture and scope of that a little bit. So these are some different images of the future and kind of how AI is showing up in them um, that kind of reflect uh, different inflection points in science, culture, politics, and ecology in ways that are designed to invite questions, thoughts, and reaction. So in Blade Runner, AI companionship is a really big part of the world. It's a little bit more um, environ like, you know, focused on environmental degradation and unequal society um, and kind of this algorithmic design fantasy girl that we see a lot of common representations of AI powered um, assistance um, with uh, in the show extrapolations like they're using AI to recapture the last of um, you know dying species and also kind of manage different um, you know uh, cloud-based systems and stuff like that 
Oh yeah. The Jetsons. Definitely. Yeah. I've, I've had that one referenced a few times. I need to like revisit it for some of the specifics, but AI is definitely showing up there with, um, you know, Rosie, um, the like robot maid and stuff like that. Um, in Black Panther, um, you know, it's more of a society that's based around, um, you know, uh, a world of ecological harmony um, with infinite energy and resources and advanced technology. And um, it's interesting just to look at how AI is viewed differently, kind of looking at some of those more maybe nature, ecological, and spiritual origins. Um, the AI is kind of, I mean, it's not that kind of typical tech and circuit things you usually see um, in AI. So it reflects kind of the values that the um, they were trying to put forward. Yes, the yeah, Iron Man's virtual assistant Jarvis, perfect. Yes, excellent. I'm so glad to see these examples. And then we also get, um, you know, things that are outside of maybe the sci-fi and narrative space, um, or I guess it's still a narrative, but Apple put out this um, piece in 1987 called the Knowledge Navigator that would help a, um, you know, help a professor find information, make calls and stuff like that. So, you know, kind of um, imagining what this world, maybe I guess that was 35 or 40 years ago at this point, almost, but it was using AI and it kind of, you can see aspects of that in terms of retrieving information, you know, annotating things that this person is saying on their call and stuff like that. So visions of the future show up really everywhere and do and kind of are designed to provoke certain, you know, reactions and um, questions. So what design futures help us do is challenge the probable. So what we expect if things continue the way they are to explore what's possible and put new options on the table so we can decide together, um, you know, with a wider group of people, what we actually prefer in our futures. Um, there's a common uh, way of thinking about futures called the futures cone that, you know, encompasses the full range of possibilities. So there's the default if things continue as, nor as uh, usual, you know, the what's possible. So based on our current knowledge, what might happen and things that maybe we think that couldn't possibly happen unless a ton of things changed. And we all kind of have our own values about what we want to happen or should happen that are personal or within the organization that we're working with. Some of the critiques of this are kind of who, who's standing at the apex of the cone right there and defining this future and whose uh, futures does it um, represent? Um, is it, you know, just the subjective futures of this person? Like what's kind of that information feeding in to define these futures? So I like using this thing called the cone of everything that's supposed to address the plurality of the past. So it looks at whose, perspective, whose perspectives and experiences are informing the future. What information sources and historical data are we looking at to inform the futures we're developing? And where, like, what are, what's our starting point for imagining those futures? So I think it encourages us to kind of look back to look forward and look at kind of what's already, what's in our current perspective and what else do we need to do to expand our aperture? So a brief history of futures um, thinking. So futures thinking in some capacity has uh, in, you know, been around for um, millennia. Uh, so at first it was divination. So oracles, tarots, astrology were all ways to try and make sense of the future. And oracles kind of controlled the um, image or production of images of the future. Like maybe in the same way, a lot of tech companies kind of dominate our images of the future today. Um, in the pre 20th century, um, it started to be shaped more by philosophers and historians. So seeing that, you know, kind of shift from spiritual to like this record keeping. And in modern futures, um, what makes them different is um, kind of around World War II, there was more of this planning for the future and kind of um, how do we kind of account for in this increasingly globalized world where we're all connected to each other? How do we really imagine things like peace and harmony and kind of different, um, you know, power dynamics and stuff like that. So the modern futures movement was secular. It was about demystifying the future and really being able to plan it with data um, and information, making the methods really explicit, um, you know, taking a systemic and rational approach and assumed the future could be changed. Whereas earlier, um, you know, oracles and things like that assumed it was kind of fixed. So it kind of brought back some of the agency and shaping, but it was still kind of concentrated usually to a limited group of folks um, who could kind of really be able to shape our world futures. And we started to counter mainstream narratives in the 70s and 60s. So, you know, some things around, you know, sustainability and limits of the planet, imagining more peaceful futures and greater inclusion of who could be a futurist. So it kind of moved out of, um, yeah, moved out of just these professional planning spheres and more into artists, designers, and lots of other folks kind of imagining the future. 
So some of the different ways we explore futures can range from a more incremental attitude to transformational attitude to change. Um, you know, where you have the kind of innovation management side um, based more on like data and quantitative things to science fiction where, you know, really the, like the, the sky or the universe is the limit. So usually kind of start off with signals, trends and patterns, collecting those and across a different subject to look at them. You know, oh, let me skip that one. And then we kind of use different approaches to choose a flavor of futures depending on our audience or goals. So strategic foresight is more of that, um, you know, like uh, database planning that folks might be familiar with. This is setting those five-year strategy plans about research and development and strategic planning. Transition design kind of looks at more complex systems mapping. Science and speculative fiction kind of embody future stories to explore those infection points. <clears throat> Experiential futures look to kind of engage multiple senses through touch, sound, smell, or acting out or participating in a future experience. So this one is a um, apartment of the future that is you know, looking at radically engaging um, with, uh, radically adapted to engage with the consequences of climate change. And then getting into some more stuff you might use is as a UX person. Um, so kind of design features might use some specific prototypes to me uh, about to kind of suspend some disbelief around change or make futures more tangible. So making it kind of less abstract and more concrete. So in, for example, in an economic system suffering from data security, consumers could be protected by a smart antenna that would detect traces left behind by data related activities. You know, speculative design can kind of more um, openly ask questions about the future um, by kind of repackaging maybe existing things with some new labels that imagine the future. So this, um, you know, project turned a uh, pharmacy in 99, 99 cents or into a time warp to sell different products um, that we might desire in the future. And then critical design takes a little bit more of a critical perspective to inspire that debate or raise awareness around societal issues. So this is actually an app you can get at the app store called Ted Hunt Circa, Circa Solar, which was representing kind of a new design for time telling and um, you know, how we might imagine different relationships with our apps and the world around us. And then um, one kind of emerging field that's getting more attention is participatory inclusive futures. So expanding futures methods and studies to include more worldviews than we usually do, especially in technology and UX. So this is um, People Bush uh, Decolonizing Futures Initiative that looks at some participatory storytelling. And I know participatory and co-design um, has been more apart for a lot of folks um, in the UX space recently. So this is kind of um, continuing along that trend. And then back to corporate and business futures, we already shared the knowledge navigator, but this is definitely really an applicable way for, you know, you and companies to really maybe put, um, you know, put a perspective out there, attract potential clients, or really push the boundaries of what you're thinking about internally. Um, so another um, great or, um, organization is Near Future Laboratory, and they do a lot of that kind of business futures. So, you know, like an annual report from the future. Um, they also did a magazine about the future of self-driving cars that imagined different products or services and things that might emerge when, in a world where self-driving cars were, um, you know, more prevalent. So I wanted to provide that overview just so you can get an idea of different approaches and I can kind of explain why I decided to approach mine the way I did. So this is a project on uh, AI and education futures and I'm sure we're all familiar with the double diamond. And for futures thinking, um, there's a uh, four quadrant approach that I like. It starts with um, different mindsets you can move through. So starting with extrapolate, we look at some different signals and talk about the risks and opportunities and implications um, you know, based on that. Then we create, we can kind of prototype different scenarios or artifacts um, to make the tensions at the core of them more tangible. You know, experience them is where you kind of share things. So maybe you create in that prototype or something like that, or a narrative of how somebody might use your AI powered product in the future and get reactions to it to kind of see like, what are things we didn't anticipate? Um, you know, and what do people think and feel about them? And then you can bring that back to strategizing really mapping the consequences and what they mean for your team, your business and your users. So these methods are nonlinear. You can kind of explore them in, in any order, but that kind of provides a little bit of a grounding for how you can kind of um, explore your kind of AI UX features. So going over this specific project, um, the goal, um, when I, I started this at my last company, the goal was to attract more work in K through 12 and from education technology 
technology companies um, and explore and address uh, equity challenges in education. So we were kind of looking at that as some core challenges and something that AI was definitely going to affect as people rush to bring it into educational products. So our target audiences were education technology companies and then systems level influencers and change makers. So we work with a lot of nonprofits, grant makers and funders, and we wanted to kind of explore also ways they could support more equitable AI features. So our output was four narrative scenarios and some reflection questions and a guide that were aimed at the different audience to kind of help them ask questions about, you know, what these features might mean for them. So we kind of incorporated everyone from these maybe ed tech company builders and founders to designers and product managers in our reflection questions. So we kind of explored a series, uh, like from some prior research we did, um, we explored a variety of technological, political, and economic uncertainties that vary across scenarios, which would include access to tools and technologies that would allow folks to use AI, biased algorithms, and the data set integrity um, of um, if AI systems are perpetuating some biases that already exist, or can we have some guardrails in place to have a more fair, just, and excuse me, equitable world. Some privacy concerns and data owner, um, ownership. So how will AI systems, um, you know, kind of manage and use student data and teacher data to provide them with ownership and control um, as they kind of look to adopt AI solutions? Um, and what sort of personalized learning potential might be realized? You know, will it support students' individual talents um, and interests, or will it kind of look to kind of hold people to more of a homogenized standard because that's easier for AI systems and data to work with? Um, we also looked at kind of inequitable business models. So if AI tools and resources in the ed tech space are, um, you know, only available to folks who can pay for them, what, uh, like what disparities will that increase in our experiences? And then teaching transformation. So thinking about the people who would actually, you know, be implementing or investing in these um, AI education solutions. So how will we kind of support teachers and educators with learning new skills and mental models, or will educators have to kind of figure that out on their own? All right, so what I started off with for this project was collecting some different signals around um, around AI and education. So I looked at everything from what are some tech developments in AI, what are new platforms coming out? How are people in this ed tech space, like teachers or school districts reacting to it? You know, are they banning it? Um, you know, teachers were creating TikToks to like teach folks how to use chat GPT to develop things like lesson plans. You know, how are students getting around and experimenting with it? And then how are people kind of integrating it into their curriculums as well? Um, so I looked at kind of some of those different things to kind of shape what would be the you know experience requirements um, for um, whatever products or services we might imagine that would shape the stories of this? Um, let's see. Sorry, I was just moving the Q and A over a little bit. So then, oops, sorry. So then what I did also is map the ecosystem of ed tech. So, you know, originally we were focused on maybe uh, products that students could use, but when you think about who's actually kind of buying the, um, you know, the ed tech solution or whatever it is, it would actually be some of the education decision makers, maybe at more of the administrative level or the leadership level. So we actually need to think a little bit more about like what their needs were and what they were looking at when they would be evaluating different potential solutions. So that's where we knew that different, you know, standards around inclusion and equity would be really important. Um, and whoever kind of had the most, um, you know, vetted, equitable, inclusive um, product that was kind of exploring these AI risks would be better positioned Positioned for widespread adoption, you know, no matter what change. So kind of that was something we could kind of develop as a recommendation for potential clients is being at the leading edge of this means that you'll be, you know, of more equitable and inclusive AI ed tech means that you'll be more likely um, to have a more stable business model and have investment like when kind of policy catches up. So then what I did with my team, so we have people with a different range of experience um, across education or even people who are parents themselves and could bring some of their own concerns in or professors um, who taught part-time. So I did these futures wheel workshops to kind of leverage our collective knowledge. So the futures wheel is, is you start from the center with some sort of shift you wanna explore. You imagine the first implication that might happen as a result of that. And then you imagine the second and third order implications. So it's a really good way to get beyond maybe your initial 
assumptions about what might happen if you bring AI technology into a space and then kind of look at positive, negative and neutral features from that. So that way you're kind of, you know, pushing the boundaries of the ideas you're exploring um, and really getting beyond like just that at um, first thoughts of what could go wrong. So for example, um, one of the first shifts we looked at was that education shifts from outputs and memorization, like a lot of the standardized testing we have now, um, it goes to more critical thinking and experimentation spaces. When we look at, you know, um, you know, how people might be engaged and like, you know, what would keep students who are kind of increasingly in this, you know, high entertainment culture, um, you know, on social media and stuff, like what would they need to stay engaged in a classroom? It's probably not standardized tests. So kind of some of the first order shifts we looked at in this like double click are um, shifts to critical thinking and thought structure at earlier stages. So making sense of information and things like that. Um, and that education systems might, off, uh, might emphasize the process and proof of creating something. How did you get there versus the end result? So kind of like math proofs as opposed to just filling in a bubble on an answer because they'll wanna see that you couldn't just look it up online or have AI help answer it. You'd wanna kind of go through some more critical thinking skills. And that would also be something that would stand out in terms of what would make somebody more employable in the future. And then getting to that next order shift, we were thinking of the idea of um, unwelcoming eyes. So opinions and suggestions might be taken as authority um, with kids not really questioning what they learn. So what level of trust will kids have in the information they're getting um, that's kind of based on AI systems and how do we kind of teach them to like think a little bit more critically. And then maybe AI interrogation becomes a key part of the curriculum. So kind of like we have made a speak in for teaching typing, maybe there's some sort of program or something that emerges that teaches AI literacy. So that's just kind of like a little example of an exercise that's like easy to do in an hour and is a great way to bring in a wide range of folks perspectives for any type of problem you're working on in the AI space, uh, because you can like kind of look at it across these different critical lenses and explore what you might need to address. So from there, what I did is I grouped it into these categories that we use in futures thinking called steep fee. So that stands for social, uh, technological, environmental, envir um, economic, political value shifts, and artistic is one I've also heard. So that can help you kind of explore some of the ranges of technological change beyond just technology. So a lot of times, you know, when we're kind of developing products or services or requirements, we're focused on a lot of those technical stuff or some of the um, user needs that might emerge. But by taking a step, you know, looking at the larger world around us, we might look at, okay, are there kind of political shifts that might be happening that we need to be aware of because there's a new requirement that's going to come out. Um, so like one recent example I think of for AI is um, how I think uh, with EU's new AI standards um, that are kind of, I guess, like GDPR for AI, um, a lot of the, of the like open AI and the open source models don't actually meet those standards. So kind of taking a, a, a wider range of the future might have enabled people to um, kind of get on that faster. Um, and I wanted to also for this project really explore some of the maybe um, social and values um, perspectives. So since we were looking at this as a storytelling exercise to really shape the ideas people have for products and services they might want to design and, um, you know, grants they might want to provide to support um, education technology. Those are more of the things you want to like, you know, push on, but obviously incorporating some of the aspects around business models like economic considerations, and then um, the tech, uh, the technological. So we could kind of explore, um, you know, what features might be part of these AI education features. So then as a group, we prioritize the risks and opportunities that came from that um, like third outer wheel. So um, you kind of looked at what were the things that we as a, um, you know, as a group of folks wanted to put forward based on our values, which were focused on responsible and inclusive design and tech. Um, and then what risks do we want to avoid? And using those, we kind of um, then went into ideation around um, each of those risks and opportunities. And this is where I kind of brought AI in. So I had every everybody kind of imagine different um, ideas, your typical kind of sticky note exercise where we came up with ideas in Miro. And then I took those and put them in a document in Notion and asked, um, you know, asked their AI system to basically, from all of these ideas, could you summarize maybe the top 15 ideas that you would come up with um, for a future of equity-centered AI, um, AI in education? Um, and then I asked it to provide some additional details and kind of color-coded to see, um, okay, like what's kind of the specific, um, you know, product, um, you know, or experience in there and like kind of what would it actually do for society. So kind of using AI to identify learning gaps and uh, develop customized lesson plans 
or explanation. So this is a way to kind of help go through a lot of information in a, you know, more in a quicker way and have it kind of, you know, generate some ideas based on things. And then another thing I also did was use AI to imagine ideas for specific actors within the ecosystem. So one of the areas we didn't um, maybe have quite as much um, knowledge on was maybe some of the different administrators and stuff like that. So I kind of would go through and ask, um, hey, can you like, you know, ChatGPT or uh, Notion, like, can you generate 10 product or service ideas for how AI could improve equity in K through 12 education focused on, you know, school administrators as that target user. And then from those ideas, I could kind of like look and see what are ones that we want to bring forward that kind of align with our values. Um, and which are ones that we might kind of not pursue. So something like intelligent resource allocation, um, you know, sounds like a great way to kind of make better use of, um, you know, helping helping with those resources. So we can really support um, using using funds and resource efficiency, maybe finding places where we can make matches between students who need support or schools that need support to distribute them. But things like truancy monitoring and attendance, so it's like, yeah, it's not one we necessarily want to pursue. You know, it was an idea for administrators, but not really aligned with maybe the point of view and perspective that we wanted to put out there. So then the next step was to kind of create those worlds. So we're starting from, you know, this one point and we have a lot of these different ideas that we want to incorporate. So I started from where are we at today? Um, you know, uh, on the right side, it's kind of this incremental foundation to change um, approach um, from a, uh, a designer called Leah Zaidi. So basically you can look at, all right, we have a better future of AI we want to get to maybe across these different spheres. And we're starting in this current place. So what are the shifts that might happen over time? time to help get us to that place. Then from there, we could develop scenarios that kind of leveled up to that. So starting with, okay, um, you know, maybe the education system stays the same, like, you know, like this would be like the kind of more future where we're bringing AI into things, but it's not changing a lot of stuff. Like we're still using AI to support, you know, kind of a standardized test-based education program, um, you know, kind of like learning for, um, you know, the test and stuff like that. Um, and then imagining something a little bit further off where maybe the education system is transformed a little bit and like what would need to happen for us to get there. So kind of help provide those ideas that we could then anchor on to tell a cohesive story about how did the design might change over time. Oops, sorry. All right, so um, what that ended up as was four scenarios. So um, there's these different archetypes of um, you can use when developing future scenarios to kind of help have different like, um, you know, maybe uh, trajectories of change. So one of the first ones you can use is like continuation where it imagines things that kind of stay the same um, and technology might like kind of accelerate continuation or growth in that area. So the experience we um, developed was one of a personalized AI tutoring platform that was available to students who could afford it. Um, so, you know, maybe some like private charter schools are experimenting with full AI teaching and curriculums, but for other folks, parents might decide to opt, like individually opt into, um, you know, some of these new ed tech programs to support better learning for their students. And some of the impacts we wanted to explore there were who would have access to this technology, what would the effect on teachers and classrooms be if you have students kind of like getting used to a certain type of user experience of teaching through this platform, and now how does this kind of interact with um, the world, the classroom world they're experiencing and like what business models you might um, have in your product or service to make sure that they are, you know, equitable or something like that. So, you know, one of the things we thought of was, okay, in this future, maybe you kind of pay per subject or you have credits or something like that. So you could kind of scale your support different ways. Um, but maybe you'd also realize that there's some inaccuracies and stuff like that in some of the um, information, because that's kind of an emerging trend we've seen in some of the um, large language models is like, you know, historical facts are inaccurate, um, you know, it doesn't maybe make the right associations with certain figures or um, some different emerging thing, like, you know, platforms, like where you can have conversations with historical figures, but a lot of times it kind of um, rewrites them maybe to be a little bit more beneficial than like, or, you know, um, less um, prejudiced than these historical figures might've been, like given the context at the time. So it's just interesting how it starts to kind of reflect the values of like how we, like how we see things. 
So the next scenario was more of a, I guess, a decline scenario where we're starting to realize some of the limitations and harms of AI education. So this is imagining a future where, um, you know, maybe we've started to adopt AI ed tech in a lot of places to do things like fulfill teacher shortages, offer AI fully AI taught um, classes, but we might kind of realize that maybe we shouldn't be, we should be experimenting in places besides the classrooms. This is where kind of some work I've done in higher education. Um, we've done a recent project on student success and equity and one of the things that I was really struck by is the amount of time that these um, different higher education, higher education administrators spend on trying to find grants and funding um, to support different programs or new classes that they want to do. So I imagined, okay, like what if we um, had like an AI powered grant finder that would help them really find the right resources and support they needed for things and like fill out those forms that match them up. Like that just seems like much more, you know, much more of a win and maybe a little less risky than bringing AI into the classroom right away. So some of the things you want to explore there is some of the participatory design of new products. So how would people in the education space, like teachers, administrators, decision makers, counselors, be included in the development of ed tech products to make sure that it's really serving their needs and is centered around their um, you know, lived experience with students and as the users of these products. Some different cultural considerations for AI. So, you know, if there's these kind of off the shelf um, AI powered teaching solutions, you know, whose cultural considerations and histories are they bringing in? Um, what an over reliance on AI might look like and teacher replacement. So, you know, what's kind of how is the role of teachers going to shift as we kind of have the balance of AI? In? Um, the next one was on kind of limits, it's limits and discipline is the archetype. So basically you start to realize challenges and um, try and address them through different policies and practices. So this kind of imagined a world where we had more of a mandate around um, AI and technological access for all students, like similar to the way, um, you know, like, uh, you know, if it was a fundamental right in education, you know, the same way lots of other things are. So um, I wanted to also imagine, um, you know, looking at like kind of some of the concerns that uh, artists have around AI um, using their art. How might we create a more like creative ecosystem for designers and artists in the future? Um, so what I imagined was maybe an AI supported augmented reality learning experience program where designers and artists could work with teachers to develop immersive versions of like their lesson plans. So if you think about, um, um, you know, maybe uh, kind of how tech workers are currently exploited and what might be higher value and creative tasks for people who do enjoy art and technology, um, what jobs for creatives might exist. Um, um, you know, supporting access to high tech immersive education platforms and then teacher upscaling. So I think imagining a world where teachers don't have to also learn how to maybe produce these high graphic things and people who really enjoy doing that, like designers or like, you know, gamers or something like that could like create these supportive ecosystems and new roles um, for types of jobs that AI could support. And the last one was uh, transformation. So imagining that education systems change more fundamentally. So we want to imagine how AI could support maybe um, redesign schools that were around cross-curricular learning labs, bringing together data and information from different sources and allowing students to pursue things they were really interested in and creating kind of personalized, um, you know, skill or knowledge um, graphs around that. So maybe instead of just having A, Bs, and Cs and taking standardized tests, you have more of a there's more of a comprehensive view of who you are as a student what you're interested in and kind of how you can kind of shape your role in future within your community so we've done some research around gen z and tech uh tech issues and shifts um that they were interested in and kind of i wanted to kind of incorporate some of the cultural and value shifts we were seeing around younger folks like really like liking to work more in pods and groups really being able to want to pursue a multitude of different identities and interests that they've kind of developed and explored on the internet and kind of really liking experimenting with technology and having less of that kind of doom you know perspective that i think a lot of people can get afraid of when looking at ai and emerging tech um, um, I also want to kind of focus on like what individualized maybe versus personalized learning would be. So maybe not totally tailoring, but providing, you know, providing a, a well-rounded picture, but still providing the right type of challenge. So, you know, you're still going to have to, you know, folks, kids who come out in the world, like are still going to have to deal with, um, you know, interactions with people of different generations, different challenges. So having a fully personalized world, like won't really kind of prepare them for working in 
yeah, a world that's complex with people with different access to things that they have access to. I also wanted to get a little bit more into some of the kind of like tech uh, recycling and reuse to address some of the resource constraints. So a lot of times wealthier school districts have access to, um, you know, maybe more emerging technology things. So like, what if we had some different systems that enabled or enabled or required companies to recycle their hardware waste into schools um, so that they could, kids could learn how to kind of play around and tinker with things in a reuse lab and also have access to the latest technology in a way that's affordable. So kind of looking at what is this kind of more, um, you know, circular and sustainable approach to all these different aspects of our technological system. And then civic engagement. So I wanted to kind of find a way um, kind of using some kind of youth enthusiasm around um, really doing like doing better things for their communities and stuff. How might we incorporate um, like local data and youth perspectives into like governance through school projects? So clearly I had a lot of fun with this one because it was like fun to imagine that transformation, but it was like AI was kind of providing this backdrop for transformation by supporting them with real time data, helping them put things together um, and like helping students develop like a more um, empowered and personal um, view of their own strengths and potential futures. So I'm going to go into um, a little bit of detail about two of the scenarios um, and kind of how I'm using AI with them as well. But I wanted to give you an overview of how we were kind of exploring how tech and social cultural change might intersect when it comes to AI and like a little bit of like who's at the center of the story is it still kind of the users and people or is it the technology. So in this first experience, and this is kind of, I have um, basically developed these narratives, kind of working on getting them up on a, like on a website and with some more um, uh, illustrations and stuff. But it basically imagined that we're like, folks were wanting to reimagine how AI shows up in education. So there'd be widespread adoption of ed tech uh, solutions that prove their commitment to equitable and ethical AI and tech, because that's part of national requirements for education. New roles might emerge like AI ed tech trainers, data set designers that are focused on equity and inclusion, algorithm auditors, and ed tech equity coaches. So like what new, um, what new jobs and positions might emerge and how, like what might they need to support that? And then educators will still kind of struggle to upskill in these like highly technical systems. So in this scenario, I imagined um, Mateo, who is a former contract artist, discovered a, a new passion for science through his work with um, Adventure, which is an immersive learning platform that avoids purely automated content by sourcing and, um, you know, uh, sourcing art from contract artists, but having them compensated fairly. So I imagine a world where kids are kind of bored of the same kind of AI generated sort of things and having something that has more of an artistic touch to it, um, where there's maybe a connection to artists might be something that they would, um, you know, really enjoy. And that's how you kind of provide local context and diversity in kind of the design of, um, you know, different immersive learning experiences. So even if you had a business model that really wants to support, um, you know, valuable jobs, still provide some freedom and stuff like that, this might be a role for artists and designers that's a more empowered AI feature than the current kind of replacement narratives that are going around. So I can see there's a new role called an immersive learning experience designer that works with teachers to kind of take their lesson plans and turn them into these immersive experiences for students. Um, and so, you know, in this scenario, Mateo is a designer who works full time at a school um, and uh, like kind of helps different teachers improve their students uh, like achievement and engagement rates. So it'll help students be more engaged with the, um, you know, with the content, but uh, without requiring teachers to learn like yet another technological platform. And then the other experience was that transformation um, scenario that I was um, imagining where um, education systems and classrooms kind of need to provide more ha like applicable hands-on skills um, that go beyond standardized tests. So if you think about, um, it would be improve their work to students who could learn anything online. So in a, in a world where, you know, folks don't have to initially go to college or will drop out of high school because you can learn a lot of stuff online, what's the value of an in-person experience? So there'd be some sort of hybrid scenario where folks are taking some sort of classes online, but schools kind of are reimagined as these hands-on gathering spaces. Um, and in-person learning might be focused on, you know, social emotional learning skills and navigating intergeneral collaboration. And it would also kind of look to uh, create a place by serving the community. So I think, you know, some of the things that came up around youth attitudes were more, um, you know, looking for ways to give back and stuff like that. So I thought about how um, we might create these kind of more self-supporting um, ecosystems of how, you know, students could learn new technology and teach it to folks in their community. And and everybody would have the kind of benefits of technology like powered by AI. So this one, 
um, I imagine um, a student who attends a community lab school that has some hands-on experimental learning spaces. They're really passionate about environmental issues and are working on a project with their classmates, like one of who's really interested in social sciences, another one's really interested in data, to kind of introduce sustainable agriculture requirements into their local building codes. So it'd be a way for students to really pursue their passions, but also get experience working in the cross, like, like you know, functional ways that they'd have to, like once they enter the workforce. Um, so we have like a repair and reuse lab that like loans out things like VR headsets and stuff um, and kind of uh, they get to, um, you know, and then students can also like teach classes and things like that. So I want to imagine AI kind of as supporting these things by bringing in data, helping them determine things to work on, but not being like the star of the show. It's really help enabling some of these values that they care about. All right, so in the last portion of this, I just want to share a little bit about how you can bring futures and AI into your design processes. Um, so I've already kind of gone over a little bit of how I use AI in this project, obviously. Um, so some of the images here um, and the summaries. So the summaries for all of these, I use AI to summarize the narratives that I wrote and the kind of scenario um, overviews. Um, and then I use AI to generate the images. So I recently took a class in AI prompting and kind of figuring out, um, you know, what different styles to maybe use for this project, exploring different creative directions for kind of building up the website. Right. So bringing features into your practice. Um, so into your professional practice, you can incorporate different methods of imagining features and implications um, into activities you already do. So I think some of the best ones um, are like the futures wheel, which is uh, one where you explore implications, which is the one I showed earlier, um, one called backcasting, where you basically basically start from a future point of where you want to go is like, um, you know, how do you want um, AI, like, what do you want your AI user experience to be? Um, and like, what are those different facets you need to think about to get there? So like, what are those actions you need to take? Maybe what other partnerships or like technological considerations you need to make that possible? You can also, um, and also just using future ideation. So maybe going beyond just with it, what's within the scope of the thing and um, bringing in some other trends and signals to look at, okay, if this shifted, um, you know, what might happen? You can also bring, if you have kind of ideas or like new things you're excited about um, around AI and UX, like, you know, bring them to life with prototypes or scenarios. Like you can develop, um, you know, a, like a little app or a story that kind of, you know, maybe explore some of those tensions you want to do. And it's a fun way to kind of stretch your, you know, design thinking in a different direction. And then with, when you're working with folks in your teams, you can kind of create ideation spaces for people's wildest dreams. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, as designers, like we can, you know, we, don't have as much trouble thinking really expansively, but a lot of folks maybe have a hard time suspending their disbelief and, um, you know, will kind of self-censor their ideas or be like, no, that couldn't possibly happen. So it's really powerful to kind of invite people to um, imagine with you and kind of suspend, um, you know, their sense of what is likely to happen for a moment. Um, and you can kind of like tap into that emotion and get people excited about, you know, maybe creating something together. Um, and then adjusting your language is also really helpful. So things like futures and foresight sound kind of scary, but we already kind of do these things. We do visioning, we do strategy, we do prototyping, you know, we imagine impact and outcomes. We look at risks and opportunities. So like the kind of language of futures, can, we can definitely be adjusted to kind of fit the, um, you know, what people are palatable with at your organization. In your personal practice, if it's something you want to, you know, talk about and explore more with people in terms of things you're excited about or things you're afraid of, there's a few different organizations or like online communities you can join to kind of imagine how these things that we're seeing coming up in the news might affect us as designers and um, kind of the people we're designing for. And I'll share a link to this presentation afterwards so you can click them, but you can also screenshot it. And then um, another thing I like to do in my personal practice, so for topics I, like I'm interested in, like AI, um, I like to track signals and trends that are interesting to me because, you know, you might be able to bring them into an ideation session or research or conversation later, or I'll just use it for my own personal thing. So it kind of is a way to kind of track what's piquing your curiosity and interest um, and have that record for yourself. Um, and it kind of just helps you, like, you know, expand, expand your, like, what you're looking at, maybe outside of your industry and things like that that and have that kind of, yeah, record of interest for yourself.
And then um, AI and design features. So I originally tried to do this presentation um, using an, uh, an AI powered solution uh, uh, platform called Gamma AI, where you basically just put an outline into Microsoft Word or a Google Doc and copy and paste it. It didn't quite, it definitely still needs some work. It didn't quite work out the way I wanted to, but it's, it, it's exciting to think about a future where I, I don't have to make another slide presentation <laughs> and AI is doing that for me. Uh, you know, as somebody who focuses on research, is something I'm really excited about. Um, I also use it to maybe even ask about specific risks or opportunities around, hey, what might be some equity risks or inclusion risks here? And it can maybe help expand your perspective, you know, about, um, you know, what uh, what you should be considering. And you can generate ideas based on your inputs um, from different ideation sessions, from meeting notes, from anything like that, or for different audience groups that you're addressing. So I guess as my final thought, um, what I'd really like to encourage people to do is use foresight and futures thinking and kind of design your futures to imagine new relationships, systems, and concentrations of power that AI can support. Not just, you know, AI is the solution to everything, but thinking about that ecosystem. So explore signals and stories, map impacts and ecosystems, you know, like experiment and design futures and share what you create with folks so we can all kind of create an ecosystem of ideas and conversations. And then, uh, yeah, I guess I have time for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelly. I was super excited to hear your presentation today because I'm a teacher, a former teacher of 10 years. So I'm super, I love to think about, yeah, the impact that AI is going to have on what teaching looks like, what it means for students to learn differentiated ways. Um, yeah, we have about 10 more minutes until our next session. So let me go ahead and ask you a couple of questions that have come in in the Q&A. Um, okay, so the first one is, what lessons have you learned from past futures or retro futures? Is there something that we've really learned to move ourselves forward as we're exploring new narratives? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm a big, um, yeah, big proponent of looking to the past. So I think when I was doing this research for this NLP project, um, you know, uh, it was just really interesting to look at things like, um, you know, what languages obviously have been included in um, in these different models. And then looking at the open source community, what are people, um, you know, developing and like what sort of, you um, yeah, what sort of norms and values or like default assumptions. So I think there's a lot of um, things like critiques of uh, the image generators um, and how if you put in, I, I know I've done this, I put in doctor, it's a white man. Um, so you kind of start to look at that and be like, well, why, why are we, why is this the starting point? And you realize that in the past, like that, those are the images it's been trained on. This is kind of the default of our culture. So I think for any project you're working on, it's worth looking at, okay, we're starting from this point maybe of technology, but a, you know, looking at um, what's my starting point and who's else do I need to consider? Because I know that we all really care about, yeah, providing, you know, inclusive experiences and designing responsibly. I think it's thinking not just about, you know, maybe including data into a system, but are there other ways that this system can serve different people's cultural norms and values? So I've been doing a lot of that in my like research work and stuff like that. And I always try to look at a variety of past futures from a few different sources and narratives. Um, in order to like really expand what's capable, like, or what's, um, expand what you're thinking about. So definitely always look to the past to look to the future for any sort of technology you're exploring, you know, like what were the origins of it? Like who um, developed it for different, you know, AI platforms and systems? Cause you'll start to learn a little bit more about, you know, like, like the creators and maybe what they were thinking. So I guess like a little example of that, looking at some of the different open source models, if you compare something like, you know, open AI and like hugging, like hugging face, like hugging face is kind of rooted more around open source, um, really being um, inclusive and responsible with their development and, you know, has like different, you know, like it's like features in the experience that were like, hey, everything here might not be correct. This is an experiment, stuff like that. And I noticed that just recently open um, chat GPT added that, but it didn't used to be part of it. But, you know, you kind of look at like, what were the, what's the ethos and values that went into um, the development of that platform and stuff. Yeah, I love that. Okay, one more question. So you mentioned strategic foresight. Are there any models that you know of for specific areas of UX or is it supposed or meant to be implemented in a cross-functional setting? 
Let's see. I think you can definitely do both, like depending on the scope of things. So, um, you know, I, a lot of work, um, so I do a lot of strategic work, um, or I do, I do a mix of things. So I, so for example, for one thing in, um, on a healthcare education or healthcare project I worked on, um, we use kind of strategic foresight specifically because it was a complex ecosystem. It made a lot of sense to bring in people who had experience with business and policy um, to understand that even if the technology, like, you know, in healthcare, the technology uh, for a lot of things is very behind in a lot of areas around like, you know, like we're still using Epic and stuff like that, which is like this behemoth of a system, but like it's because of, um, it's because of regulations and politics. So you kind of, sometimes you need that interplay to, you know, understand why aren't we at this point if we have this technology and you realize that, all right, the politics need to shift. Um, so I guess you can kind of, depending on what your what scope you're imagining at, you can use it in both ways. So I think you can definitely also use it at a UX level. So if I were imagining, um, you know, maybe a different, um, health, you know, healthcare app powered by AI, like there's some different ones around um, the things that summarize like your, um, summarize your doctor's notes and translate them into like, you know, layman's terms, so you can understand it and we'll define terms really simply. Um, and uh, like kind of keep those records like that. But you might, you know, you might use strategic foresight to imagine, well, what else might people want in a few years? Like maybe, um, you know, maybe it's, if you look at, I don't know, the ecosystem of healthcare, like maybe folks have caregivers they want to share it with or have some sort of family thing or something like that. So you can really apply the methods to, you know, any of these methods, um, you know, the right one, like at different scopes and scales. It could be as small as exploring a, like a, a feature or like, you know, UX or experience shift, or it can be exploring something, you know, bigger, just depending on what you want to explore. And then the output would just be different, you know? So if you're trying to tell a system story, you might want to, might, a narrative might be helpful. If you want to maybe kind of play at what are some of those interactions and experiences people will have, that's where some of those, like, um, you know, maybe like a UI prototype can be super helpful. So things like the work of uh, like Ted Hunt, who I referenced in there, like does a lot, of, um, you know, our usual things we interact with like you know, like our phones and stuff like that so that's a nice way to kind of explore how you might bring futures into maybe more of the um the modes we're used to designing in mm -hmm.